Hey, what's up, Solutioneers? Happy New Year, and welcome to the very first episode of our new vlog. I'm Matt Prindeville, CEO and Chief Solutioneer at Upstream, and we're gonna be putting out vlogs like this weekly, where we're gonna be delving deeper into topics like reuse and takeout and delivery, and how we bring reuse back for beer and soda, and ways that you can help co-create the new reuse economy in your community. But today, we're gonna to talk about how Upstream got started. So right around 30 years ago, an activist named Helen Spiegelman in British Columbia and an ecologist named Bill Sheehan in Athens, Georgia became friends. Now, back then in the 90s, the big question in state and provincial governments was how much recycling should we have? Should, we, should it be 30% or 40% or 50%? But Bill and Helen were part of a band of radicals that said, no, we should be striving for zero waste. And of course, back then, it seemed like a crazy idea. But fast forward 30 years in the future, and you've got the biggest cities in the world striving to become zero waste cities. You've got uh, the biggest corporations in the world that are implementing zero waste plans. We even have zero waste lifestyle influencers with millions of followers. So, of course, they were onto something. But through their work together in the 90s, they realized that the movement that they'd helped to create had really become overly focused on the end of the pipe. And they said, we're never gonna be able to recycle or compost our way to a sustainable future. We really have to work upstream to redesign the systems that are generating all the waste in the first place. And so they founded Upstream all the way back in 2003 to catalyze conversations with business, government, and nonprofit leaders to do just that. The first big idea was to bring a cornerstone environmental policy that was starting to flourish across the Atlantic from Europe to the United States. Now that policy idea was called Extended Producer Responsibility, or EPR. Essentially, it's about making big corporations accountable for the environmental impacts of their products by ensuring that the financial costs for sustainable design and for managing that product at the end of its useful life when consumers are done with it are the responsibility of the manufacturer. And that the cost for better environmental design and taking care of the environment is incorporated into the price of the product, a process called cost internalization. And Bill and Helen recognized that to start a movement they needed a rationale for why business and nonprofit and government leaders would want to support EPR. And so they rolled up their sleeves and they dug into the research and what they found was fascinating. They went all the way back to the beginning of the 20th century and looked at how modern solid waste management systems came to be. Back in the early 1900s, there were no solid waste management systems. And in many cities, there weren't sewer systems either. So how did people get rid of all their waste? Well, back then people would literally throw the garbage and the waste from their chamber pots out into the streets. Horses were also the main mode of transportation and the streets were filled with horse poop. And of course, this created breeding grounds for vermin and rats and all kinds of bacteria and lots and lots of people were getting sick. It was truly a public health crisis. And so the wealthy women of New York City came together and persuaded the mayor and city council to create the first municipal sanitation department in the United States. And in a few short years, the streets were literally transformed by an army of sanitation officials who set up garbage collection and street sweeping and helped to better manage the informal recycling sector. And of course, this became a incredibly successful model and other cities rushed to duplicate its success. Back then, most of the products and packaging were made from simple natural materials like paper and leather and cloth and glass and metals. And the biggest thing that people disposed of was actually coal ash, because that's how they heated their homes and their workplaces and their apartment buildings. But if you flash forward 50 or 60 years from, from then, we're now in the post-World War II economic boom. Plastics uh, have come on the scene and the amount of products and packaging in the economy and in the waste stream 
really just exploded, just took off. What Bill and Helen realized through their research was that the municipal solid waste systems that had been set up to solve a public health crisis had inadvertently become kind of a government funded welfare for corporations. Essentially, a company could product, uh, could, could design a product, design a package, package it any way they wanted to, put it out into the marketplace and have no responsibility for the impacts of that product, really leaving it to governments and taxpayers to figure out what to do with that product or that packaging at the end of its useful life. Companies were essentially being subsidized by not having to pay for the waste that they generated. And the solution was to pass extended producer responsibilities that would put the onus for sustainable design and for the collection and reuse and recycling of their products and packaging onto the companies that were putting the products into the marketplace in the first place. Bill and Helen published these findings in a groundbreaking research paper called Unintended Consequences, How Municipal Solid Waste Management Enabled the Throwaway Society. And then Bill became a environmental Johnny Appleseed of sorts, working to seed organizations of city and state government officials across the United States to advocate for EPR policies. Though I wasn't working at Upstream back then, I started working with Upstream way back at the very beginning. At the time, I was working for an organization called the Natural Resources Council of Maine, and we were working on the nation's first EPR bill to require TV and computer manufacturers to collect and recycle their products. Back then, there were only a handful of experts who knew anything about EPR in the continent, and the upstream folks were se several of the major leaders. And so I called Bill up, uh, and we successfully worked together to pass the country's first EPR law for electronic waste, which ended up becoming the model for the rest of the country. Upstream would go on to build and support a movement that has now passed more than 100 different laws in 40 different states, making companies responsible for the collection and reuse and recycling of television sets, computers, mercury-containing thermostats and light bulbs, paint, pesticides, pharmaceuticals, and now packaging. It's a legacy that has created a platform for our current focus and success in reducing single-use packaging and growing a thriving new reuse economy. Bill and Helen and our founding board of directors recognized that policy was an important lever to help usher in a circular economy. But today, policy is really just one of the tools in our toolbox. We also are, are focused on working directly with businesses to help support them on this journey through our business innovation project, and also by helping create the cultural and social conditions for a thriving new reuse economy through our social impact project. I really hope that you enjoyed our first vlog, and if you liked it, please remember to like and comment and share and subscribe, and we'll see you all next week.